Order, order. David T. C. Davis to move the motion. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hosey Mayor. Thank you in advance for your chairmanship and, uh, and guidance here. And can I say that following our conversation earlier on this morning, I'm fully aware that this is a sensitive issue. I have concerns about this, but the concerns which I have about self-identification of gender are not in any way directed at anyone who is unfortunate enough to suffer from some form of gender dysphoria. Um, I have met actually many trans women who share my concerns about this and who want nothing to do with the kind of activism that seems to be going on and which seems to be shutting down debate. So the criticisms which I have are of government and ministers and of politically uh, motivated organisations, many of which actually have access to public funds. The uh, law at the moment is that anyone who wishes to change their legal gender has to apply to the gender recognition panel. Um, there are a number of things that they have to show. They have to show that they've lived as their preferred gender for two years, that they've been diagnosed with some form of gender dysphoria, and they have to commit to living uh, as their new gender for the rest of their lives. But one of the things that they don't have to do is to undergo any form of medical treatment, any surgery. They don't even have to be taking any uh, hormone pills. The vast majority of people who have changed gender <coughs> maintain the bodies in which they are born. As far as I can find from the statistics, only about one in five people who have changed gender have had any form of surgery. And this is uh, the cause of concern for many people. Self-definition of gender is already happening. Organisations seem to be ahead of a law which the government may or may not be about to change. There is a particular concern about what's going on in schools at the moment for children because guidance is being given to schools by publicly funded organisations such as Mermaids and others which is encouraging children to question their gender and to redefine it if they wish and to be able to do so without their parents even being told about it. And this can quickly set off a chain of events which can begin with children as young as 12 being given uh, puberty blockers about which uh, there are many medical concerns and there has been at least one doctor in my own constituency who's been giving these drugs out to children as young as 12. This can then uh, progress on to hormone blockers um, which have powerful and irreversible side effects and then once people start on that road there is a danger that they may end up um, having more drastic and irreversible surgery because once one is on that pathway it becomes difficult to get off. Teachers who've tried to question this or question what is going on or fall foul of the activist groups are liable to find themselves being disciplined. People like a teacher called Joshua Sutcliffe who was disciplined by a school in Oxford after committing the, uh, the offence, a new word on me, of misgendering a group of pupils He'd apparently said, well done, girls, after a maths exam, although one of the girls identified as a boy, and for this he was disciplined. The, of course. Being way, that uh, incident indeed happened in my community. I, I think I would like to point out the way that he's portraying it is, is far simpler than the bigger issues that were surrounding that. And in fact, it wasn't just that single incident. There was a number of incidents uh, of that teacher in not that specific case but in other uh, points in the school and I, may I just you know remind him that sometimes these things are oversimplified um, and, and would he agree with me that actually oversimplification of such a sensitive and complex issue sometimes isn't helpful. Well the Honourable Lady's right but I, if I oversimplify it's partly so that she can have a chance to speak. We've only got 90 minutes and this is the first time we've debated this issue properly in the House of Commons so um, I look forward to hearing her uh, more, her longer explanation about it. Of course. I thank the Honourable Gentleman and I congratulate him on bringing this debate to Parliament. Such an important issue and a great opportunity for us to have a respectful debate and discussion. But as parliamentarians, we have a duty not to oversimplify and to make sure that we properly educate ourselves and that we have an informed debate and discussion. Does he agree? Absolutely, which is why I've spent quite a lot of time talking to women who have concerns about this. And very few members of parliament have been willing to educate themselves and come along and meet people who have those concerns. It's notable that when we've had meetings in the House of Commons, very, very few people have turned up to listen to the concerns of activist feminist groups who feel that this is going to have a huge impact on their lives. 
So I look forward to the support of the Honourable Lady at future meetings that we may have, and we look forward to seeing her. Uh, the Government is now considering legislation which would do away with the checks and the balances which are currently made and to allow people to redefine themselves as any gender they wish. So, as far as I can see, this would mean if the uh, consultation, once the consultation has ended, if the Government do what is being recommended by the Equal Opportunities Committee, that people will at any time be able to change their gender. There would be no need to live outwardly as that gender, let alone to take hormones or have surgery. So a 15-stone bearded man could simply define themselves as female, and there would be nothing anybody could do to object to this. Now, one might think that this doesn't matter, and in fact it doesn't if that's what people want to do. I'm a libertarian. I'm a believer in freedom of choice, so as far as I'm concerned, that's absolutely fine, until that becomes an issue for other people, for other people's rights. People who might outwardly appear to be male and possess a male body would, if they have redefined legally their gender, suddenly gain access to women's toilets, hospitals, changing rooms, refuges and prisons. They would have the right to undertake roles that people would normally expect to be done by somebody of the same sex as, uh, as the services being offered to. So, for example, as nurses or carers conducting intimate procedures, prison or police officers carrying out searches, or staff working in refuges for the, women, uh, sorry, for the victims of domestic violence. We saw an obvious example a few weeks ago of what can happen and what will happen more, uh, on a more regular basis when a convicted male sex offender who had redefined himself as female was able to insist on his right to be put into a women's prison where within a matter of days he had carried out four sexual assaults on women. Another example was given to me by someone who has been the victim of long-term sexual abuse as a young person. Of course, of course. So the Honourable Member has cited a case claiming uh, that this proves that the government should not change the law in respect of gender recognition, and yet the case that he cites, of which I, I don't know the detail, has happened under the current uh, arrangements. Doesn't that actually point to a failure of risk assessment procedures rather than a problem with the law? Well, no, on, because the point I made earlier on at the start is that organisations such as prisons and schools are ahead of the law. They're already allowing self-identification of gender. Um, the second point I'd make is that... Yeah, but can I just finish, because it's an, an important point to this. There was certainly a failure of risk assessment there. Um, shortly after that case happened and, and uh, the court case concluded, I asked the head of probation and prisons in Wales if there had been any change to the guidance given to the uh, prison authorities about housing transgender prisoners, and I was told there wasn't. I subsequently sought to put in an emergency question about this because I hope the Honourable Lady would agree with me. It's appalling that vulnerable female prisoners, many of whom themselves have been the victims of, of, of frankly, of male violence, are being put at risk in this fashion. Um, but it wasn't deemed important enough uh, to be discussed in Parliament. Uh, I think the Honourable Lady. Again, for, he's being very gracious to give way a, a second time to me, but may I, may I just clarify, is his assertion that prisons and schools are doing something illegal under the current Act? No, I've not asserted that at all. I've said that prisons and schools are allowing self-identification of gender at the moment. The, the, law, the, law, the law may well change shortly following the consultation to give this a legal footing and to allow people to legally register their gender as being different to the one that they are born with. But the practicalities are that this is already happening. That's a point I've made several times. Okay, but I'm, I, I'm conscious other people may want to speak, and I don't want to use up all uh, of their time. So, I thank the Honourable Gentleman for giving way. And, and does he not agree that it seems strange to cite an example of a failure in the current system as a reason for improvements in the system? And equally, that, you know, he mentioned women's refuge. Uh, Linda Rogers of Edinburgh Women's Aid noted that the reality is that any service has the potential to be abused, and we deal with that wherever uh, direction it came from on a case-by-case -case basis. She's also said, I don't think this should be used as a reason to restrict the rights of a particular group. Surely he recognises that these incidents, that we should not make policy on the basis of some individuals who may abuse the system, it should be about equality and fairness for everybody. Well, absolutely. But the point I'm making, I'm sure, is a reasonable one, that if people are legally able to redefine their gender, um, then 
there will be absolutely no way that the prison authorities or whomever will be able to stop people who redefine their gender from going into uh, the, uh, you know, a male, for example, who's redefined their gender from going into a female prison. It's, the point is that it's already happening. It's bound to become a lot easier if somebody is already... I will maybe perhaps one last time. I'm guided by Mr. Mr. Hosier, but obviously if honourable members wanted to speak, then... Uh, the honourable member appears to be making an argument uh, that protection uh, of women prisoners uh, is only to be protected uh, from trans women. Actually, in all of those services, we need to uh, protect all uh, prisoners from a range of uh, potential uh, hazards. And those things should be applied on the basis of the individual cases, not on the basis of someone's gender identification. How is he making the argument that that risk assessment should not apply equally? It could apply to other women, uh, not just to trans women. Well it, well, it could, but the reality is, the reality is that the vast majority of sexual assaults are carried out by males against females and I'm told that the figures are in the high 90s for this and I believe that. I mean there, may, there, there are relatively, in fact extraordinarily rare occasions where women may assault males but it, let's be honest about it, it is very very unusual. So clearly if we take, if we allow people, people who've been convicted of sexual offences as males to redefine their gender and insist on their right to go into female prisons then we're clearly going to be putting women at risk. I, I don't see you know, how anyone can, can fault the logic of that. And we've already seen what can happen when this goes on. Um, the other example which I wanted to give was of uh, somebody who, uh, who's been involved in speaking out about this, who's been the victim of long-term sexual abuse, who was helped by a women's organization in the south of England. Uh, and, and I won't go into the detail of what went on there, but it was, it was, it was horrendous. And she told me that there is absolutely no way she would have been able to access the, that service from anyone who was male or have anything to do with that organisation if anyone male was there. She's subsequently been told that anyone who defines themselves as female will be able to use the service and will be part of the, the group that help women who've been the victims of sexual abuse. And she would not have accessed that service today because of it. And I, I think there are many other women in the, uh, in the same situation. So the point that I'm making is that before any legislation has been passed, we are already seeing organisations such as schools, hospitals and prisons allowing people to define themselves by a different gender to the one that they are born with and in, which the, and in the majority of cases to which their body corresponds. And it does have an impact on others. It has an impact on the rights, particularly of women, to privacy and to sex-segregated spaces. Um, I think one of the... Uh, one of the issues that, I, that particularly concerns me about all of this is the lack of debate that's gone on. I'm grateful, Mr. Hosey, for the fact that we've been able to have this debate here today. But whilst groups in receipt of public funding such as Mermaid seem to have an, act, uh, an open door to government and select committees, anyone who expresses a concern about this is frankly ignored. Uh, <coughs> I mean, Pink News seem to have abandoned any pretense at objective reporting about this issue and vilify women's groups and lesbian groups who want safe uh, sex-segregated spaces. Women's rights activists who have met to discuss the impact of these changes have faced verbal and physical harassment. Those who have been resisted, uh, such as Venice Allen, have been subject to, frankly, ludicrous, vexatious legal action and have been dragged into court to defend themselves for speaking freely about their concerns. Um, I saw this myself after I arranged a meeting for a women's group in Parliament after one of the venues that they had organised had been cancelled in central London. It was actually at Millwall Football Club. I know that numerous complaints went in before the meeting to the, um, uh, to, to the House of Commons authorities. I was called into a meeting with the Sergeant at Arms uh, as the Minister will know, I've been an MP for 13 years, and like most MPs, I've organised numerous meetings for numerous groups. I've never before had to go and spend an hour with a sergeant at arms explaining myself. I've no uh, problem, by the way, with the conversation that we had, but it's very, very unusual for that to happen. I tried to organise another meeting afterwards. Again, I was contacted by the sergeant at arms office. After the meeting that took place, numerous complaints went in, mostly vexatious, but it did result in a three-month investigation by the Standards Commissioner. Again, I've got no problem with that. I've got no problem with the conclusion that she made. But this is very, very 
unusual. I was even told by another Member of Parliament that I could face police action because of what had taken place, um, because of the potential for public order offence to be committed. This is about debate. This is the sort of debate that we're having now. We have a right to discuss these issues. But the problem is that if people know that meetings that they hold are going to result in investigations and legal action against them, even if it's going to amount to nothing, then obviously they're going to be far less inclined to hold them. Minister, this government, which I'm a, uh, a supporter of by and large, is proposing fundamental changes which is going to have a huge impact on people. And it's been done, in my view, without proper consideration and in an atmosphere of menace. Many, many people are deeply concerned by what is going on. And I would urge ministers and members of the relevant select committees to listen to these concerns, to actually <coughs> meet with some of the groups that are concerned about what's going on, rather than ignoring them, which I'm afraid, Minister, is what's happening at the moment. Whilst some organisations seem to have an open door into the office of ministers of government, other organisations, well, Minister shakes her head, but I can perhaps ask the Minister to tell me how many times have ministers met with transgender trend or a woman's place? How many times have ministers of this government met with mermaids or with other pro uh, um, uh, trans activist groups. Can I suggest to the Minister that people should not face dismissal from their jobs for suggesting that women cannot have a penis? It may be an issue with which we can have, about which we can have different opinions, but it's certainly a debatable point at the very least, or for the so-called offence of misgendering. Women who want safe uh, same-sex spaces are not transphobic. They're not committing hate crimes. They're simply reflecting a concern for their own safety which I'm afraid, as a man, I have to say, for far too many, is based on a valid fear. I hope the government will stop listening to some of these activist organisations and start listening to people outside the M25, very often, who have a different opinion. And I say to, all, to the Minister, with all due respect, I've supported this government through thick and thin, as, as the, the Honourable Lady knows, often um, in rather difficult circumstances. But I absolutely say to the Minister, I will not support the government over this. And not only will I not support it if the government go ahead with what I think they're planning, I will do my utmost, and so far as I can, to stop any changes in legislation going ahead, which is going to undermine the safety of women and change our society in ways that I think are, frankly, very concerning. The question is that this House has considered the proposals to allow self-identification of gender. Alayla Moran. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hosey. For, uh, it is a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship, and I would like to congratulate the member from Monmouth for securing this debate. And I, uh, whilst I, I, I do think we are uh, perhaps on, on opposite sides of, of some of these issues, I do agree absolutely that not enough debate has been had in this House on this matter. And I, I, I'm very grateful uh, for the um, opportunity to be able to speak in the debate today. Uh, especially this week, because it is, of course, Trans Awareness Week, which, uh, and yesterday was the um, day of transgender remembrance, a day when we are meant to be remembering the huge inequalities and, in fact, the uh, number of transgender people who have died over the years because of the oppression that they have faced. And um, I do hope that today the Minister will join me in solidarity with this community that over the course of the last few months has had inordinate amounts of abuse hurled at it from all quarters. Um, however, I think today is an opportunity to shed some light rather than heat in this debate, uh, and in particular on the issues that underpin some of that heat. Um, I'd also like to start by placing on the record my thanks to my Liberal Democrat colleague and friend, Helen Belcher, who I've been working with closely on this matter. Now, I'd like to start by placing on the record that I am wholeheartedly behind the government's proposed reforms of the Gender Recognition Act. I believe that they are proportionate, I believe that they are well thought through, and I believe that it is time that Britain caught up with many other countries around the world, to which I will come to later. That said, I absolutely appreciate the sincerely held concerns of not just the member for Monmouth, but many others, 
including my constituents who have contacted me to say that they are worried about aspects of these proposals. My constituent Juliet said, I'm frightened by the fact that women's voices are being dismissed and silenced. Uh, my constituent Nicola wrote that it has taken me several days to build up the courage to email you for fear of being labelled transphobic or hateful. And believe me, I am not. I fully support the rights of the trans community to live their life without discrimination. And I think it is a damning indictment on not just us, and we need to take our responsibility as politicians for shying away from what is a very controversial and sensitive issue, but also the media, who I don't believe have treated this with particular fairness on many sides. And I think what we need to try and achieve in this debate today and moving forward is a way to bring those two sides together because I don't think that it is a conflict to be a feminist and also to believe in trans rights. Since my election in 2017, I have been making sure that ministers are aware of the views of my constituents on both sides of this debate. And I would particularly like to thank the minister's colleague in the other place, Baroness Williams, for taking the time to meet with me to discuss these issues. And so to say uh, to the Honourable Member, yes, I haven't been attending his meetings, simply because I've been listening to my constituents and working in other ways on this issue. And I, I do take slight offence at the insinuation that because I haven't been attending his meetings that I don't care deeply about this and I haven't been engaging in the debate. I appreciate that ministers are considering responses to the public consultation, but in the summing up, it would be encouraging to hear from the minister about what steps the government is doing to re actively reassure the people who are, are worried about, about issues in, in the reform, but also, furthermore, what active myth-busting is occurring or is planned to be occur about these misconceptions. And, and that is the crux of my speech today because I want to talk in particular about the issue of self-identification and self-declaration. Um, and to start, it's important to put this in the context of the current Equality Act, in 20, the 2010 Equality Act, because it's what that already allows that we can then talk about how it might be reformed or changed. The Equality Act gives protection from discrimination to people on the basis of both sex and gender reassignment. It, it is the Equality Act that describes the exemptions which allow single-sex spaces. It is seen as a legitimate aim to provide safe spaces for women, but it is not seen as proportionate to exclude all trans women from those spaces simply because they are trans, and that is an incredibly important point to make. Furthermore, the Equality Act gives protection under gender reassignment to those who have undergone, are undergoing, or are proposing to undergo a process or part of a process of reassigning their gender. And it's probably worth mentioning at this stage the sorts of interventions and operations that some trans people choose not to have is firstly their own medical choice to make, but secondly, think for a moment of the extensive operations that would need to be, that would need to happen. There are many who are put off simply because it is painful, it is uh, expensive in some cases. Some of the reasons why they don't feel able to uh, do it is because only a certain number of licensed practitioners in the country are allowed to do it, and actually some prefer to go abroad to do it, but that's not recognized in this country. So there are many, many, many complex reasons why that 93% exists, and actually the reforms go some way to removing some of those barriers. There are no formal... I will. Can you what she says? Can I bluntly ask you if you'd be happy sharing a changing room with somebody who was born male and had a male body? If that person was a trans woman, I believe women are women, and actually, yes, I would. Absolutely, I would. And, uh, yeah, I, uh, I just don't see the issue. And as for do they have a beard or not, which was one of the comments that the Honourable Member made, there are women who have beards, I dare say. You know, there are all sorts of reasons why our bodies uh, react 
differently to hormones. We have many, many, many forms of the human body. And actually, I see someone in their soul, in their person. I'm not really, I don't really care if they have a male body or not. Um, in essence, the Equality Act already works on the basis of self-declaration of gender, as it does for religion and sexuality. And, and just coming back to the point the Honourable uh, Member for Monmouth made earlier about um, society being ahead of the Act, that's actually not the case. Society is implementing the Act as it currently stands. But the concern voiced by some people that reforming the Gender Recognition Act to allow self-direct a self-declaration would allow men into women's spaces, I do believe needs some more discussion. So of the 12 constituents who have contacted me since my election on these issues, it is a feature of all of their correspondence. Um, there are other things that come up, but that's the, t that's the top one. So for example, Elizabeth says she fears the risk of males choosing to change their legal gender in order to gain access to spaces and opportunities reserved for women, that's her main concern. However, the Gender Recognition Act simply allows a trans person to change their birth certificate and have that be reissued. It actually doesn't change what's currently in the Equality Act. And actually, uh, I, I was being uh, uh, appreciative of the time and that uh, the Honourable Member didn't want to take more interventions, but my question would be, in these reforms, are we saying that we want to roll back the 2010 Act, because actually, if you are questioning uh, the collective view, why we allow trans women into women-only spaces, that is a provision under the current Act. So in fact, if that's what's being questioned, it's a rolling back of the current Act and not a reform. However, let's think about what would happen if a man did self-declare as a woman using any reform gender recognition proposal and then try to enter a women-only space for nefarious purposes. So, that's, so this chap is so intent on doing this that this is the, the way that he wants to, he's going to get himself a new birth certificate, which by the way, it is a fallacy to say, when people say, oh, I'm going to decide this afternoon to change my gender, that's a complete fallacy. There is nothing in the reforms that suggests that you can just on a whim decide to do this one afternoon or in the morning I'm going to be a woman, or in the afternoon I'm going to be a man, or anything like that. Actually, the, the current reforms are proportionate, they are considered, but they are not knee-jerk, and they understand the fact that these decisions are some of the most personal decisions a human gets to make. It's about who, in, who they are, who fundamentally they are as an identity. This isn't something that people do lightly. But let's say someone did want to do this, right? I will, of course. I thank the Honourable uh, Lady uh, for allowing me to, to intervene on her. Of course, she's, she's setting out a hypothetical uh, situation. But in fact, there are a number of countries which already have uh, simple self-declaration administrative processes for gender recognition. Argentina, Denmark, Ireland, Malta, Norway uh, and Colombia. Um, is she aware of government single-sex service providers or criminal justice sectors in these countries uh, reporting negative imp impacts from that implementation? I, I thank the, uh, the Honourable Member very much for intervention because the answer to that is, as far as I'm aware, there are none. And this is uh, perhaps another point to make is a lot of the concern is coming from hypothetical anecdotes, uh, often very, very simplified versions of much more complex events. And actually, I, as a former science teacher, science teacher, care a lot about the evidence. What is the evidence of what's happened? So I'll come to that in a moment, but it's a very well-made point. So let's assume, then, that this person wants to go into a woman-only space for nefarious purposes. Um, it would actually be quite a stupid thing to do, because apart from anything else, if this offence was committed, it would show evidence of premeditation, which would increase their sentence. And if the certificate had indeed been gained for the sole purpose of entering such a space to commit crimes, then it would also be a separate crime under the Fraud Act. So actually, if someone was intent on harming women in this way, I would argue that this would be one of the more stupid ways to do it. And quite apart from that, it's, it's a hypothetical situation that is removed from what the evidence shows. So I think that's really important. And indeed, yes, Malta, Norway, three... But over the last few years, there's no evidence at all. But, but importantly, because of the way the Equality Act worked, we don't have to look further afield. Just look in, in this country. 
In this country, the current Act already allows self-identification for those who are even considering proposing to go through the process. And what evidence is there in this country of self-declaration, which has been going for eight years now? Well, again, there's none. So this has the signs of a moral panic that's being whipped up to demonize a community. And I'm not saying that my constituents are doing that specifically, but there are some who are intent on rolling back the current Equality Act, and I'm deeply concerned that they aren't being called out for wanting to do so. I will, of course. gentleman cited violence against women that this conflates the issue and actually male violence against women is mainly carried out by men and as, as she rightly points out has nothing to do with men identifying as women and you know if the honourable gentleman is so concerned about violence against women that's what he should be focusing on I uh, hear here and I completely agree with that Point. And I think it's really important to make sure that we are talking about the right thing. Violence against women is, is still ubiquitous. It's still something that happens in our own societies, in our own streets, and it's something that should be absolutely called out. And in a sense, these reforms are entirely separate to that. We need to be coming together to do that. And I'll be curious to know, you know if, if the Honourable Member uh, who's called the debate has attended those meetings on violence against women in this House. The Women in Equality Select Committee 2016 report found that the process of gender recognition was bureaucratic and costly. The government's LGBT survey published in July this year reported that trans women were being deterred from applying for gender recognition for the same reasons. I spoke about some of those reasons earlier, but it noted that 93% of those who wanted gender recognition had been deterred from applying for it. So, but what I also point out, the 93% of people who respond to a government consultation on something, these aren't people who at a whim are thinking about changing their gender, possibly. These are people who have grappled with this for a very, very long time. And I think their, their concerns are also worth listening to. I will, of course. I thank the Lady for giving me. She's making an excellent contribution. Does she agree with me? I mean, on, on that very point about people, trans people who face huge barriers and a medicalised process are being damaged psychologically by our own legal framework and that at our very core, we are here, I believe, as elected representatives, to make the lives of our constituents better and make sure there is a level playing field. And if we don't act and we don't work together on this, more trans people will, will, will commit suicide and more young trans people, who we already know the statistics on this, will face more significant barriers and that we absolutely must work together to, you know, to, to, to understand the concerns, to address them, but to make sure the, their voices are heard. I thank the Honourable Member for her contribution and I absolutely, absolutely agree with, you, with her. Now, our laws were groundbreaking when they were introduced actually back in 2004. And now our law on gender recognition lags behind other countries and it does disadvantage trans people on some actually very questionable grounds. And I'm not sure the basis on which a lot of the people who raise concerns feel that this is wrong. You know, it is, it is also a point of values that in our society there is indeed a level playing field and that we also recognize that we are so society is more complex, it is evolving, we are, for, we are recognizing rightly more and more intricate parts of society. And as British politicians, I you know, think it is incumbent on us to protect those minority groups and to understand the issues that they face. And so these reforms, I think, are just a logical next step to our evolving understanding of what is a very, very small number, a very small and vulnerable number of people in this country. Um, and yes, many of them are children when they first start to discover this. And I personally believe that, uh, as a, again, a former teacher and lived M education spokesperson, that schools are doing their utmost to make children feel that it's okay to be different and to have a space in which they can discuss these issues, to suggest that that then extends to encouraging them 
to change their gender, I also think is a bit of a, is a, bit of a step too far in the role of schools. So I am pleased, in conclusion, to support the reforms of the Gender Recognition Act, as well as maintaining my support for women-only services. And these remain vital for many. And the point about violence against women and the point about needing to protect uh, women from men who sexually abuse them, this is absolutely the case. But the point is, to be a feminist and to be a supporter of trans rights is not in conflict. These two need, can absolutely sit together and we need to look at the evidence of not just what the law currently says. I will, of course. She says she supports women-only services. By women-only, does she mean anyone who defines themselves as a woman? He brings me on to my next sentence because I was about to say that trans women are women. And moreover, trans rights are human rights. And so I am very grateful for this debate today because it has allowed some of us, I believe, to start to broaden this debate, deepen this debate, and to start to put some of the record about this issue straight. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jose. It's a, a pleasure to serve under your chairship. And I am very grateful to the Honourable Member for Monmouth. Um, you know, he raised a number of issues and concerns in his contributions. And it is important that this debate remains respectful and that we are able to have a reasonable and decent conversation and consultation. And I commend you know, both the UK and Scottish governments on their consultations. The Scottish government's consultation received a huge number uh, of responses, and over 60% of those who responded were in favour of the proposals. Um, and, you know, he, he, he talked, I think, in oversimplified terms on a number of occasions. And I, I go back to my original point about that not being helpful, that, that, that deepening the debate and expanding the debate about some of the concerns and some of the issues is absolutely vital. And the Honourable Lady uh, for Oxford West and Abingdon made an excellent contribution. Um, and I think that the points that she made about concerns about rolling back on the Equality Act were, were, were concerned me greatly. Um, and uh, the hypothetical uh, example that she used uh, highlighted perfectly that, you know, Id identity fraud es essentially, you know, would be a crime and that we have to remember that. Um, and, you know, the 93% the of people who, you know, seek uh, in the trans community who, who have sought to get support, who have sought to access services being turned away is, is, is a shame and a stain on our society in my view. And yesterday was Trans Day of Remembrance. And that it was a day when we took a moment to celebrate the incredible contribution that trans people make to our communities and to reflect and remember our trans siblings who've been killed, committed suicide or faced prejudice and not been able to live or be recognised in a way of their choosing. And it's my firm belief uh, that the matters in front of us today are about exactly that. Living in a way of our choosing without fear or prejudice and having a legis legislative framework that supports people to do exactly that. Now, Mr Rosie, I started school the year that Section 28 was introduced. That was a law that meant schools and teachers could not talk to students op openly about their sexual orientation or gender identity without fear of losing their jobs. Now, so much of legislation around LGBTI rights have been and still are based on fear rather than acceptance. We have come a long way in all parts of the UK. I commend her and her government on the work that they have done and the other governments around the UK, uh, particularly the Scottish government, who have gone a little bit further. And I hope that you know, perhaps we can meet at some point and discuss you know, uh, the um, the spousal veto and the fact that that's something that has been scrapped in Scotland and has meant greater equality uh, for trans people. But Section 28 was scrapped in 2003. By then I was halfway through my university degree. I grew up 
believing that if I came out, I couldn't live a normal life or that I wouldn't have equal rights. Now, I am an ardent feminist and I am an openly gay MP and I am not about to shut the door on the equality of trans people just because people like me have now got greater equality. And those of us in the LGBTI plus community and all of us who believe in equality and enjoy greater equality must do all that we can to support others who are marginalised and discriminated against. And the reality is that the legislation as it stands in terms of gender recognition, whilst it was absolutely groundbreaking in 2004, is now out of date. Medicalising and marginalising people who, who are trans, in my view, is absolutely wrong. And we recently celebrated a new chapter in Scotland for LGBTI people as inclusive education has become a reality. I know that the UK Government are also working on this, but I want to take a moment to recognise Time for Inclusive Education, TIE, Liam Stevenson and Jordan Daly, plus all the many organisations who have supported us in giving briefings today, Stonewall Scotland, LGBT Youth Scotland and the Trans Alliance, and who worked on that legislation and those policies in Scotland, John Swinney, Angela Constance and Christina McKelvey. Now, you know, I appreciate that sexuality and gender identity are two very different things. Um, but the challenges I faced in terms of coming to my sexuality, not coming out until I was 32, I cannot imagine how difficult it must therefore be as somebody who is trans and is trying to operate in a system where they their transition is medicalised, where they have to travel hundreds of, sometimes thousands of miles, as the Honourable Lady for uh, Oxford West and Abington mentioned. Many trans people feel that they have to go abroad uh, because it's their only choice. I have met with a number of constituents, a number of young people in my Livingston constituency who are trans, some who are pre-op, some who are post-op, and the kinds of challenges that they have faced are truly heartbreaking. And even in Scotland, where we have, I would, you know, we have uh, come, I think, se uh, second top of uh, inclusiveness of the LGBTI Global Index, we still have a significant way to go. And it is my view that living in a country and society where your orientation or identity does not have legal recognition and you don't have equal rights is corrosive to the soul. And that is why at the very core of this, reforming the legislation and to changing our societal view and structures will follow from changing the law on gender recognition. And I recognise that the debate has become very polarised. That is a source of great sadness to me. I don't think it helps when the media uh, sensationalise. Absolutely, there are cases where systems are being abused. We must recognise that. We must address those concerns, but we must not make policy based on a few individuals who seek to abuse a system. There will always be those who will seek to abuse the system. That is regrettable. They should be dealt with appropriately, but we do not make policy on the basis of that. Now, I'd be happy to give way to the unrelated. Thank you very much. As she's rightly pointed out, it's a small minority of people um, who, who would seek to cause other people harm. However, over half of trans people in the UK have attempted suicide and 84% have said they've experienced suicidal thoughts. Does she agree that a lot more needs to be done to protect and support them? I absolutely could not agree more with the Honourable Lady. She makes a very powerful point. It is a, sh it is a stain on our society that trans people feel so marginalised Many of them feel so marginalised. And in this debate and in this discussion, we must do all that we can to raise our voices, to show our support for them, and that we make sure our policies and our laws properly support them and recognise them. Now, the Scottish Government had its own consultation on reforming the Gender Recognition Act 2004. Um, it ran from the 9th of November 2017 to the 1st of March 2018. We had 15,697 responses. 60% of respondents were in support of the government's proposals. We have to recognise that 40% were not. And it is important to recognise that, and it is important to understand why that is. Nonetheless, they are the figures. 
Now, the, the Honourable Gentleman for, for Monmouth raised a number of concerns about uh, um, domestic violence and, and services, uh, w you know, women's services, and I just want to, you know, give him a few quotes from what other, some of the organisations in Scotland have said. Rape Crisis Scotland Chief Executive Sandy Brindley said, I think the most important thing to say is that the proposed changes should make no difference to the provision of women-only services. That's where some confusion has arisen. There isn't any rape crisis which would ask to see documentation of gender. I mentioned Linda Rogers of Edinburgh Women's Aid, um, who said there are concerns out there that our service could in some way be abused by allowing people to self-declare their gender, but said this wasn't something she'd heard from the organisation's staff or board. The reality is that any service has the potential to be abused, and we would deal with that, whatever direction it came from, on a case-by-case -case basis. Roger said, I don't think this should be used as a reason to restrict the rights of a particular group. On young people, which I know is something that many people have a concern over, Stonewall have said being able to access legal recognition would have a hugely positive impact on trans young people's health and experience in education. Like all young people, trans young people get on better at school and college when they're supported to be themselves. This is particularly important given the alarming rates of transphobic bullying happening in Britain's schools today and the impact that this has on trans young people's mental health. Lowering the age at which young people can obtain legal recognition would also raise awareness of trans young people's needs and support from schools and colleges to address misconceptions and stereotypes that fuel, trans fuel transphobic bullying. There was a case study that Stonewall offered uh, from uh, a, a woman called Susan. My daughter deserves to have the legal status and identity that matches who she is. I don't understand why people can't accept that everyone has a right to, uh, to, li to live their life being truly themselves as long as it doesn't break the law or impact ne negatively on anyone else. And I just want to share with the Chamber an experience I had earlier in the year where I visited Malawi and I met with a number of trans activists and I heard their stories about their experiences in a country where it is illegal not just to be uh, trans but to be gay. In fact, trans people have no legal standing in that country. So one of the, the activists I met had been in their workplace attacked purely on the basis uh, of being trans who went to the police and was told to go home and dress in their proper identity and come back and that, that crime could then be recorded. Now, that is a world away, I would like to think, from where we are. But the mental and physical toll that it had taken on those activists was terrifying. And I think we have to absolutely recognise that changing one's gender is not something that anybody would do lightly. And they would, it would be you know, a very rare thing and be dealt with appropriately, should anyone do that, for nefarious reasons. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that it's really, really important to recognise that. I'd be happy to give away a... Uh, I thank the Honourable Lady for giving way, and she's making a, a very powerful uh, speech, and she described her experience in Malawi and said that's uh, a world away. But sadly, we know that 41% of trans people have experienced a hate crime uh, in the past year, and certainly I know from talking to some of my uh, trans constituents that that's consistent uh, with their experience. In reality, don't many trans women need precisely the same male uh, protection from male violence and access to safe spaces that other women need? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with the Honourable Lady. And I would just, you know, close by saying that I hope that the Honourable Gentleman and others who have concerns will be assured by the fact that women's groups such as Rape Crisis Scotland, Scottish Women's Aid, Zero Tolerance and Gender, Equate Scotland, Close the Gap and Women 5050 campaigns have come out in support of the proposed changes in Scotland and indeed their equivalent organisations in the UK. We must recognise there are concerns, we must address those concerns, but we absolutely must hold a mirror up to those who are uh, marginalising and attacking trans people and their rights and recognise that there is a groundswell of support for equality, for a change in the law to ensure that gender identification and the processes that trans people have to go through are discriminatory at their core and we absolutely must change the law to ensure that they are properly supported and the law reflects that, and our society reflects that.
John Butler. Thank you, uh, Mr. Jose. And um, uh, I want to I want to thank the um, member for bringing this debate to the House today. Um, it is absolutely right that we need to have the debate, the discussion. I think that it should have happened sooner and earlier. And by doing that, maybe that void that was created wouldn't have been filled with such hostility. Um, I'd also like to start my remarks by recognizing, um, as many here today have recognized, that yesterday was the Trans Day of Remembrance and reflect on the 369 cases of reported killings of tra trans and gender diverse people, and one from the UK. And this was just between the 1st of October 2017 and September this year. And also reflect on the number of um, trans people, especially students, who we heard as well have considered um, taking their own lives. Um, it is important, uh, Mr. Hosey, that what is discussed in this house and in this place is accurate and sensitive. And I do feel that the Honourable Member for Monmouth, that some of his remarks were not as sensitive as they could have been. And we have to remember that people will be watching this debate, people who are transitioning. And we have to remember um, that we are decision makers and lawmakers, and they'll be looking at how we address this issue. Um, absolutely. Thank you to the lady for giving way. It's certainly not my intention to cause any offence uh, to anyone, be they trans or otherwise. So perhaps the Honourable Lady would educate me a little and tell me what comment did I make that she thought was insensitive? Um, one comment that you made um, was that you said uh, people were, who were unfortunate enough to suffer from gender dysphoria, this has a negative, a very negative connotation. Um, just like if people used to say they were, people were unfortunate enough to be gay, or you, know, you are unfortunate enough to be a woman, or unfortunately enough uh, to be black. So, um, I think that how you, how you speak, uh, you, you, and it's, it was um, picked up on in regards to you talking about simplifying, sorry, sorry Mr. Jose, that uh, the member for um, Mammoth picked up on simplified cases in such a way as to um, sensationalize it almost, and it's unnecessary in this kind of debate to, to do that. Um, the UK's legislation... Sure. I mean, I just would suggest that, um, is, again, on this dysphoria point, it wasn't my intention to cause any offence to anyone who's trans. I, I've tried to make that clear throughout. But my understanding is that this is a medical condition, that gender dysphoria is, a, a, and, and it has to be one at the moment. It's... Um, uh, it's something that has to be diagnosed. So, so clearly, um, if somebody has a gender dysphoria and is unhappy with their gender, I would suggest that might be an unfortunate situation to be in. But, uh, I, it, you know, I'm, I'm certainly not in trying to undermine uh, the rights of anyone who's transgender in saying that. I'm sure the transgender community will be a little bit reassured um, by your uh, last comments. Um, the UK's legislation is so out of date that it no longer is, we are no longer considered a world leader on, the, uh, on LGBT plus rights. We were once number one. We were run, once right at the very top. We slipped to third, and now this year we are fourth um, in the rankings. And the ILGA European uh, Rainbow Europe Index Report cites a surge in transphobic media coverage to why we are falling down that league, uh, that league table. Um, the Labour Party has a proud record of championing the rights of equality, including LGBT plus uh, rights. And it was the Labour government that brought in the Equality Act 2010 and the Gender Recognition Act uh, 2004. And it was Labour government that abolished Section 28 and created civil partnerships. 
However, we need to recognise, uh, Mr. Jose, that LGBT plus people still face widespread discrimination, and it's clear that we must do more to enhance the rights and uh, the protections. And the, the Gender Recognition Act 2004 is now simply um, out of date, and it needs amending. Um, and it is just about, and I think this is also clear that we talk about the facts, it is only just about changing the sex and gender now on birth certificates. Because apart from birth certificates, the name, title, gender marker, and all UK identity documents can already be changed. And it's been working well for like over 40 years. And in fact, most trans uh, people don't want to go through the indignity of of getting a gender recognition certificate, and most trans people now don't do that. Um, so the government, uh, when the minister stands to her feet, will have the support on this side of the house uh, to make the changes and amendments to the Gender Recognition Act. And I want to just go through um, a few more facts. Um, that uh, deliberately making a false a statutory declaration is a serious crime and is punishable by imprisonment. So as we have heard uh, by, the, uh, by the, the heartfelt contributions uh, today that it's, it's not something that is done lightly. Um, and uh, the reforming of the Gender Recognition Act does not uh, affect access to single sex services and facilities and that has been made clear today as well. Um, and Absolutely. For, for her contribution, I mean, would she be able to confirm uh, that to the issue of prisons, it is already the case that very high-risk trans uh, women are sometimes not held on the female estate because there aren't facilities to house them. And in those specific cases, depending on a risk assessment, they are sometimes even held in male prisons. And that just goes to show that Actually, the system as it stands now already works. And if someone were to be uh, considered a high risk to that female-only population, that actually that would, is already provided for in the system and the guidelines. That is absolutely correct. And the failure was uh, of the prison authorities, not of the system itself. And they should have gone through certain panels before making that decision. And, and I think um, and it, wasn't, it was nothing to do with the principle of the um, Equality Act. And uh, we've, we've got good information that says that there was a transgender expert uh, who consulted on that particular case, but that expert was not listened to. The expert was overruled. And I think the failure of Leeds prison authorities to act on the advice in regards to this particular, um, uh, this partic this particular person arises from the reaction of the tragic suicide of um, Vicky Thompson in Leeds, and we think that's maybe why that particular case happened. But again, it's not a failure of the system, it's a failure of the prison authorities. Um, uh, Mr. Hosey, um, Labour recognises the rights of all groups to debate uh, the implications of reforming the Gender Recognition Act, um, and they all views should be listened to and supported. And we've listened to various groups with vastly differing um, opinions. Um, but it doesn't mean that we will be bullied into taking one side or the other. Decisions and laws should be made on facts and it should take into consideration uh, the majority and not just uh, people who are sensationalising uh, certain aspects of a case. As I've said, with 45% of trans students attempting suicide, um, the government's delay in amending the Gender, Gender Recognition Act has contributed to some of the fraught um, and toxic debate, which I hope we will be able um, to move on from. And I have just a few questions for the Minister um, uh, when she gets on her feet, which I'm sure she will appreciate. Um, will the Minister outline the government's planned timetable for reform of the Gender Recognition Act, including the publication of their response to the recently closed consultation? Uh, will the Minister also outline the government's plans to launch their separate calls for evidence on issues faced by non-binary and intersex people and confirm that this will not delay the much-needed reform of the Gender Recognition Act? And um, as per the LGBT Action Plan, will the Minister update on how research is going 
um, into the Tell Us Once service being a sustainable model for trans people to update their name and gender across multiple de departments only once. Um, and, and also, and I'm sure this is the case, but just for clarification, will the Minister confirm that there will be no loss of rights of trans people as part of this uh, Gender Recognition Act uh, reform? And, and I'd like to um, conclude my remarks, Mr. Jose, by um, a letter uh, from um, one of our Labour activists, uh, Heather uh, Pito. And, um, and before I do that, sorry, Mr. Jose, I'd like to also thank a lot of the organisations that are fed into us, such as Unison, Stonewall, um, Diva Magazine, uh, my LGBT advisory panel, LGBT Labour and, and our PLP LGBT group because it's really important when we're making laws and legislations in this place that we listen to people with lived experiences. For too long, laws have been made uh, for people, about people, without them having a place around that table. Well, uh, absolutely. Thank you very much. I spoke to a young trans woman who found herself homeless and she told me she was put into an all-men hostel and was very scared for her, scared for her life is what, what she said, but scared for her safety. Does she agree that when we're making law, we must make law to protect all women and that absolutely must include trans women? I thank, I thank my honourable friend for that intervention. Absolutely correct. Trans women suffer from abuse, and violence, domestic abuse, assault in the streets, just as every other woman. And, and we need to recognize the intersectionality of women, and we often don't. It's often just some women who are recognized or have this privileged uh, position where they're recognized, where it's important that we recognize the intersectionality of women, and that includes trans women. Um, and in a way, she's made a, an excellent contribution, and if I it can. I would just like to share with the Chamber uh, an excerpt from uh, Baroness Helena Kennedy's excellent book, Eve Was Shamed, about the experience of trans prisoners that illustrates her point excellently. One of the most distressing cases I ever conducted was defending a young transgender woman who had been raped and vaginally damaged by a former partner. She had gone to the police and reported the violation only to be greeted with rid ridiculing asides and suppressed laughter. This case predated the Human Rights Act and reforms in rape law and the Equality Act. Her experience at the hands of the police was so wretched that she decided to withdraw the allegation, whereupon the police charged her with perverting the course of justice. Now, this is a long time ago. Things have moved on, but there must be no rolling back of rights because of exactly cases such as this. I thank uh, my honourable friend from Livingston, if I might refer to her that way, for that um, intervention too. And that feeds very nicely into um, Heather's letter, who's been trans for many decades. And she says this, um, not so long ago I was assaulted in a club when a stranger came over and roughly grabbed my crotch and breasts to see if I was a woman. I would call that sexual assault, but the police with stretched resources gave it low priority as it was lad having a laugh and drunk, when drunk. Being pushed over and abused in the street has also become commonplace again. When it happens now, myself and other trans people have to weigh whether it's worth reporting it to the police at all. Is your indignity worth the time it takes to go through all the police processes, the triggering of old memories of being sexually assaulted and the police's lack of concern? For, for the more minor assaults, usually it isn't, but for the rapes and domestic violence, support it is. <coughs> the trans women need support and safe places, just as other women do. Thank you, Mr. Hosey, and um, it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. And may I start, firstly, by thanking my honourable friend for securing this debate and for enabling us to um, have these conversations about what is a very, very important area of our society in the 21st century, but also... It's uh, an area where I think a lot of us are still feeling our way, if you like. And uh, I'm, if I may, I'd like to thank all members for the respectful tone in which they've conducted this debate. I, I get asked about this issue, you can appreciate, um, uh, regularly. And the one thing that I think we all share is the 
sadness that this very important debate sometimes, I'm afraid, gets taken over by um, very, very um, loud and, and sometimes aggressive campaigning uh, by um, uh, activists who I'm sure feel, uh, feel their you know, beliefs, believe, have their beliefs very strongly, but perhaps lose sight of the fact that we've got to be able to talk about this in a reasoned and a respectful and also in a caring fashion. Because I think the huge majority, the vast majority of the public, and I'm pretty sure also parliamentarians, are in the middle. Um, we, we want to uh, talk about this debate in a caring, but also in a careful way, so that we, as a society, um, get to a position where we are all comfortable with the uh, consequences of changes to legislation and so on. So with that in mind, I've also drawn out the fact um, that some of the um, debate is, is there's, there's perhaps a lack of understanding or we need to um, uh, help organisation schools, other organisations that have been mentioned, help them understand what the law is so that they can apply the law in their services uh, uh, and can do so with confidence. And so that's very much something I'm taking away from not just this debate, but from the discussions that we are having more generally. And may I just mention that um, we've tended to focus on trans women, but of course this debate involves trans men as well. Uh, and I'm going to be dealing with that uh, uh, towards the end of my speech. Um, may I start then by emphasising that uh, the consultation has just closed. It closed on the 22nd of October. And uh, those who have looked at the consultation, I hope, will have noted that the questions were very open. You know, there was no, de quite deliberately, there was no trying to lead people down a particular path or avenue because we wanted to ensure that uh, we hear f a, a range of views from as many people as possible to see how the current system is working. And so I know that the title of the debate is, is uh, about self-identification, but no decisions have been made yet as to uh, what, if any, changes are to be made to the Act. The consultation was about seeking views, and, and please, please, uh, people shouldn't walk away with the idea that we have made up our mind yet. It's only been a couple of weeks since the consultation closed, uh, and no proposals have been um, put forward uh, as to self-identification or other ways in which we can um, uh, deal with this uh, act. Uh, the consultation ran for 16 weeks. It received more than 100,000 responses, which shows the uh, level of interest that uh, this topic attracts. And uh, my uh, hard-working civil servants are now working on analysing uh, those responses. Uh, we hope, uh, in response to uh, uh, the Honourable Member for Brent, we hope to have a government response to the consultation ready uh, in spring next year. She'll appreciate 100,000 responses. It takes a bit of time to work through. Also, we want to make sure that we get you know, the right response. Um, and uh, it is in that response we will set out the next steps. Um, she also asked me about... Uh, uh, calls for evidence uh, regarding intersex and non-binary people, uh, and we're going to publish uh, the call for evidence shortly. It won't cause delay to the response to the overall consultation. Uh, and she also asked about the Tell Us Once service. Uh, work is ongoing in the Government Equalities Office to deliver this commitment in the action plan. And then she asked the question about the rights of trans people. And again, I'm grateful to, as I say, my honourable friend for raising this debate because it gives me an opportunity to say there will be no loss of trans rights, trans people's rights. Um, you know, we, this consultation is an open consultation to try to determine uh, what, um, what, what the law is and, and, and where people's thoughts as to its application in the 21st century. Now, I understand... Um, that the Honourable Member for Monmouth is uh, concerned that women's views and uh, the views of women's groups have not been heard as part of this consultation. And I really do want to reassure him that the government is committed to hearing from everyone, including 
um, the groups he has mentioned. We do not want to close down this debate. Uh, we, we don't want to, we absolutely do not agree with those who some, seek to vilify the views of people who don't agree with them. Um, and for, I, for one, have, have been on record for some time for having grave concerns about the uh, development of things like no platforming in our universities. Because it seems to me we absolutely should have the confidence to talk about this, to express our concerns, to ask questions, and to be able to do that in a way that uh, is met with respect and with, um, uh, and, and so our questions are answered. And, yes, of course. The front bench uh, shadow minister for equalities and women has said that Labour fully support debate on this issue. The Honourable Ladies just said the same thing. Would they, presumably in that case, both support local authorities, Conservative and Labour, in allowing groups like a women's place or transgender trend to hold meetings in local authority buildings? Well, I, I take the view that, um, you know, the law on... Uh, we have the, the principle of freedom of speech. It seems to me that um, as long as we have the debate in a way that doesn't, you know meet the very uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, legal markers that we have very clearly about hate crime and so on, it seems to me that of course we should have debate. Um, and, and, and this is, a, I, 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 I don't know, I, I think we're almost, some, sometimes people are just too scared almost to talk about things and that shouldn't be right. We don't want um, fear in this uh, debate or in this climate. We, we want people to be able to express their views respectfully and, as I say, in a caring and careful manner um, so that we can ensure that questions and so on are flushed out and answered. Now, to give um, uh, some uh, indication of the sorts of uh, people that my officials uh, uh, have met in terms of their views and what I have called the sort of rainbow, rain, rainbow full of views, the spectrum of views on this topic, um, my officials have met uh, uh, women's groups, those who run and administer refuges, domestic abuse charities, local government, LGBT groups, unions, service providers, transgender charities, government departments, European governments, and also um, organisations who campaign against reform of the GRA, including Fair Play for Women, Women's Place UK, and Transgender Trend, uh, but also... Uh, feminist organisations who support reform of the GRA uh, because we absolutely, our, pr our principle with this uh, consultation has been openness and listening. But as the government considers the options, uh, there are a, a couple of points I'd, I'd like to make clear. Since the uh, Gender Recognition Act has come into force, transgender people have been able to acquire a new birth certificate which matches the gender they live in. Um, but experience has shown that some people find the process difficult and intrusive and uh, some uh, gen transgender people don't use it for those reasons. They're therefore left with a birth certificate that doesn't reflect the gender in which they live their life. Now, without a new birth certificate, transgender people are unable to marry in the gender in which they live their life. They can't claim their pension at uh, the age appropriate to that gender and for those uh, who uh, are perhaps a, a little older, they also run the risk of, or they live with the worry, that their death certificate may carry a name and a gender that hasn't applied to them for decades. And so this is, you know, this is one of many reasons why we're looking at this through the consultation. For a transgender person, um, changing their birth certificate requires them to obtain a medical diagnosis of gender dysphoria, obtain a second report from a medical professional detailing any medical treatment they have had, such as hormone treatment or surgery. They must sign a statutory declaration that they intend to live in their acquired gender until death. They must provide proof of having lived for at least two years in their acquired gender. They must pay a fee of £140 and if they are married, the consent of their spouse is also required. This documentation is sent to the Gender Recognition Panel, uh, made up of legal and medical experts, who make a decision as to whether that person has fulfilled these requirements. And if they're satisfied, they will issue a Gender Recognition Certificate, which is used to obtain a new birth certificate. The transgender person never meets the panel who makes this decision about them. 
Now, when the uh, government introduced, the UK government introduced this act in 2004, it was at the time world leading, as the Honourable Member for Brent has said. And so we feel that the time is right now to ask whether it is still uh, appropriate and or whether it needs improving. And we've heard uh, from, as I say, 100,000 people on this, but of course also colleagues across the House. Uh, absolutely. Um, uh, also, in, in regards to the gender person not meeting the uh, panel, we also have no right of appeal, which I think is very cruel also. Will the Minister agree with me? Well, as I say, we're, this is under consultation, and that is a point that has been raised in the consultation. Um, yes, of course. Uh, right, Honourable Lady, for giving way, and, and her point about the, the time being now is very important. Also, she mentioned a number of organisations that she's met with. It does concern me, however, that there are organisations out there who are purporting to suggest that someone's gender identity is a trend. That, to me, is deeply offensive because it is akin to somebody telling me that my sexuality is a trend. And I would absolutely refute that in the strongest circumstances. The reality is that trans people across the UK are facing murder, homelessness and violence. And it is important that we absolutely change these laws as soon as possible. Well, I'm grateful to the um, Honourable Lady, and I, I'm about to move on to something she spoke about in her speech, but uh, she, she may know that I have, um, I'm on record as saying that uh, I, don't, I, I would never dream of using the word trend in this context, because the very use of that word risks uh, demeaning or de minimising the journeys that people are on or have been on. Um, and uh, again, it's, it's that, it's, to my mind, it's, it's that we come back to the point we have to be caring and careful in the way we discuss this. If I may just correct for the record, um, the, the list of organisations um, have been met with my official, have met with my officials just to, uh, uh, to correct the record as it were. Um, the, I'm, I'm so sorry, yes, of course. I was so grateful for the Minister giving way and it was on the point of spouses and uh, just to relay a, a story of um, uh, a friend of mine whose spouse was asked to provide this certificate and found that deeply concerning because their feeling was well who am I to stop my partner from defining who they are and in fact it stopped them from going through the process uh, and again would she agree that this is one of the issues that is being looked at and is potentially problematic? Uh, again I'm very grateful uh, for that intervention and, and this is as I say it's part of the consultation and, and uh, that, that uh, uh, issue of spousal um, uh, consent is, uh, is very much a, a matter that um, we will be looking into with these responses. But uh, the Honourable Member for Livingston um, gave, I think, a, a very moving account of her own personal experience, but also uh, colleagues have given uh, accounts of the uh, experiences of those who have been on or are on uh, their journey and the challenges, sometimes the heartbreak that they face. And I know from my own, uh, the conversations I've had with um, trans people, you know, that th th there is a great deal of um, uh, sadness often in the, their long, in their process of coming to this decision. Not necessarily um, their own sadness, it can be the sadness of others who surround them, you know, and, and so it is, uh, it, it, I'm very, very conscious of, of the experiences of people um, who have been through this. And, and as I say, the, the, the um, key words for me, as I say, are, are being caring and careful on this uh, issue. And I say careful because um, of some of the concerns that have been raised today. And I, I absolutely uh, understand uh, those uh, people who have raised concerns, for example, about women's refuges. And, and um, colleagues will know that uh, as Home Office Minister, I'm taking through the draft domestic abuse bill um, uh, in the coming months. And uh, the, I know that people are concerned that uh, refuges will no longer be able to provide safe spaces for women. Uh, please, please, can I make it clear, this is not the case. Um, domestic abuse services, including refuges, have robust risk assessment procedures and can exclude anyone who may threaten a safe environment for victims and their children, as well as signposting sources of support uh, for those people whose needs they may not be able to meet. And I'm very conscious from my own conversations with 
uh, refuge organisations that they take different approaches to this issue, and, and I, I, I welcome that. You know, I'm, we have got to um, be in a situation where we can offer support and refuge services to people regardless of <coughs> their lifestyle, their, their background, and so on. So um, it, this is something I feel I, I absolutely understand people's concerns, and I hope by having this debate I've been able to offer some reassurance to those people who have those concerns. We are committed to maintaining protections for single-sex services, and we will continue to consider as part of our response to the consultation whether any further action is needed to reaffirm this approach. Um, and just to be clear, the, <coughs> the single-sex exceptions in the Equality Act 2010 allow a service provider to provide a service for women or for men um, if an organisation needs to uh, define it in a way that does not allow a trans person to access their services or provide a service to them in a different way, they are able to do this uh, as long as they can show it's a proportionate means of meeting a legitimate aim. Now, um, the issue of transgender offenders has understandably been raised as well. And the case of Karen White has been particularly um, uh, examined. Um, may I be clear, the case of Karen White is appalling. Uh, there were a series of terrible failings that should never have happened. Uh, and uh, in light of this, my ministerial colleagues at the Ministry of Justice are looking again at the decision-making systems that apply to the management of transgender prisoners as well as how they were applied in this particular case. May I uh, touch gently upon the issue of children? Um, because this is something that, uh, although it's been touched upon briefly, I know is um, of concern uh, outside uh, the walls of this chamber. And uh, we have no intention of lowering the age at which people can legally change their gender, namely at the age of 18. We recognise that there has been an increase in referrals of children and adolescents to gender identity services for uh, people aged under 18. And so uh, we have committed to improve our understanding of the impacts on children and adolescents of changing their gender and gather evidence on the issues faced by people who were born female who transition in adolescence. That, uh, there are, we are not the only country in the world to be um, witnessing this, experiencing this, and uh, we need to understand why this is happening. I'd like to thank, as I say, in closing, my honourable friend for calling this debate. I hope I've been able to reassure him on some of the concerns he has raised, as well as um, concerns that have been raised uh, by others who uh, perhaps hold different uh, views. Uh, this government is absolutely committed to ensuring that everyone in our society can thrive and to upholding the rights and protections that all our citizens enjoy. We want to support and protect women we want to support and protect and improve the lives of transgender people. I hope these are two amb ambitions that has the support of the House. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. David, 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 to sum up briefly. <laughs> Thank you for that. And just to begin by saying that, of course, everyone who has concerns about this in any direction totally condemns any violence against anyone who is transsexual in any way. Those responsible for physical or verbal assault or any other kind of abuse deserve to be punished by the full force of the law. And I've never met anyone who, uh, who, who disagrees with that proposition. I'd say respectably to the um, honourable members for Livingston and I think Oxford and Abingdon uh, that I have, in fact, tried to educate myself on this issue of violence against women over a number of years. In fact, I served on the Home Affairs Select Committee between about 2005 and 10 when it brought out the, uh, the reports on forced marriage and female genital mutilation. And I raised this issue on many occasions in the House of Commons. I was glad when legislation was passed about this, especially on FGM. I'm disappointed, actually, that despite all the laws and the fine words, there has still not been a single conviction of anyone for, force, uh, for female genital mutilation. But that, if you like, probably wonders a little bit from the topic. But violence against women is, a, is an important issue. On the consultation that has gone out, 
I'm not very surprised that so many people seem to be in favour of changing the law because Mermaids, a publicly funded body, has published online a primer encouraging people to fill it out, which I think is, uh, is not right. But the, the important thing here, the issue comes down to this. If people believe a trans woman is a woman, then it is not possible to protect uh, female sex segregated spaces in the way that many campaigners would like uh, because, uh, because many people do not accept the proposition that a trans woman, woman is a woman. A trans woman is a trans woman worthy of respect, absolutely deserving of protection in the law against discrimination or physical or verbal assault, but not necessarily eligible to access uh, single sex areas. And finally, can I welcome the fact that on all sides there seems to be lip service at the very least given to the uh, idea of debate. I very much welcome that and I hope the Minister will set an example here by encouraging any local authorities who wish to, to allow groups like a woman's place to hold meetings in, uh, in, 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 within local authority areas and also to meet with some of these groups themselves. To the best of my knowledge, those meetings haven't yet taken place, although I've certainly tried to facilitate them. So I look forward to that happening in the future. Thank you. Proposals to allow self-identification of gender. As many of us of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. We'll suspend the sitting until 11 a.m.